Senior League, who has uh, come to Afro Germany. She studied uh, she did her PhD in uh, Würzburg, in the under the supervision of Bertha and Gerber, uh, working in the department of uh, Heisenberg, right? Who has done long time pioneer work on uh, learning and culture. So after her PhD, she also worked the Hironita in Munich. Uh, and uh, since 2013, she has her uh, own position, she has her own group at the uh, Leibniz Institute in Magdeburg. And she's uh, working on uh, dissecting out the uh, learning memory pathways using the fruit fly, our favorite learning. So I will mean, let uh, I said take over and tell us about it. Thank you for the introduction, thank you for managing my visit also, and thanks to you for coming to the call. Um, I'm going to um, try to give you an impression of what we do in my group, which is there since two years. And it's in the big picture, it's about associative learning in the fruit fly. So now, um, well, there are different ways of surviving, right? So you can choose not to move at all. But we animals, we move. So we act, we have to do things. And then it is a bit of a problem to choose what to do or not. And um, in the choice of action, it's important to take into consideration what has happened in the past, what is the present need, and what is going to happen next, the future. So basically, associated learning seems to be at the heart of this integration between past, present, and future. So basically, animals can learn things, and such past experience enables making predictions for the future, for the upcoming events. And these predictions can be integrated with the present needs of the animal in order to then regulate the action, or not. Now, um, so associative learning is critical for action choice, and that's why it is uh, conserved across all these organisms that people have studied so far in terms of associative learning. So the um, typical, classical, and first experimental example of associative learning is how of the odd, obviously, many of you may know about it. So the dog is trained with uh, pairings of a, a sound stimulus, a tone, and food reward, and later on the dog starts to celebrate in response to the tone. This is because the dog can anticipate that the food is coming. So whenever the tone is sounding and the food is becoming, so the, uh, there is a rich repertoire of physiological and behavioral um, activities. Now, I would argue that um, fly, associated learning than the dog. So let me tell you why I think that. It's because um, although fly is a rather simple uh, nervous system, there are well established associated learning paradigms in the fly. So, and rather complicated behaviors can be assayed. And we have very rich collections of mutants and RNAIs for the fly. And these two things together basically enable us to um, look at the genetic basis or the molecular mechanisms of learning. In the fly. And uh, why do we do that? Why do we bother about the fly at all, right? This is because we hope, and this hope comes true quite often, actually, there are concerned molecular mechanisms that mediate associated learning from, uh, from the fly up to the humans. Now, in addition to that, fly has transgenic tools which um, enable us to interfere with neurons in a very specific way. So, in the big the circuitry, which is called the brain, you can target even single neurons in the fly. And uh, together with the fact that the brain is rather small and rather few neurons, this enables us to make very detailed neural circuit analysis. And why do we bother? Because it's the fly, it's not the human, why do we care? We care because we think that small neural circuits can give us some principles which can then be conserved up to the higher end. Then we can look for them in rodents or humans. And in addition to that, because these uh, circuits are small, they can be implemented in computational models, and the hope is that maybe later on also in robots and so on. So basically, these are the reasons why it makes sense, I think, to study with the flag. And I hope that you will see how, um, in our own research, we take advantage of more or less all of them. All right, now, um, I told you that there are rather established fly associated learning. One of them is all factors which is learned. I'm sorry for this, but it's really not in my hands. The thing is looking wrong. <laughs> so, um, so can you read it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so one such very well established paradigm is the uh, punishment learning with all factors stimuli. So the fly is coming and 
they are exposed to two different smells, two different odors, and one of these odors is paired with electric shock smells, which are painful. And after such training, we give the client the choice between this odor, which was previously paired with shock, and this other odor, which was the control odor, was not paired with shock. And then most of the slides run away from this odor. So we can quantify that in the learning index. So from now on, we will see these box plots where I show the medium and the quart mass, basically. And uh, the way we calculate the learning index and ends up in negative when the slides have avoided the learning order. So negative values indicate avoidance of the learning order. Now, um, interesting, the timing is everything. So in this paradigm, if we only reverse the timing of the two stimuli, such that the shock comes first, and once the shock is over and the pain that entails is gone, we present the other. Just by this change, we can induce the opposite behavior in the slide, which is reflected by positive dynamics. So the slides approach an olfactory cue, which is associated with the relieving end of pain. So that's why we call this relief learning. Well, you can think of when, when you go to the dentist and you come out, you're sort of euphoric because you're, you know, you got rid of your pain. So everything looks a little better. So this may be another one of that. <laughs> All right. Now, um, here in this experiment, you can see uh, this, these two effects more systematically. Now, I will show you data from different groups. And they're all trained like this, except the inter interval between shock and odor is changed systematically. So on the x-axis you see the interesting <coughs> and y-axis you see whether the slides have avoided this order after training or they approached it after training. You can see that if the time between order and shock is too long, in either direction you don't get any learning score. This is because too long intervals don't really enable associating the two stimuli with each other. If you train the slides such that order comes first and then shock follows, you see the strong condition avoidance of odor because it's a punishment predictor now. Whereas if you train the odors with shock first and then give the odor, you get this tiny little approach. So here I plotted four different data sets which were collected you know, over the years by us in different cities and labs. So basically you see this effect all the time. The point I'm trying to make is that although this um, effect is very small as compared to this huge one, it's very reproducible. So, um, and that's why I want to say that just by changing the relative timing of the stimuli, you can basically result in opposing kinds of learning, right? That goes versus the others. Now, um, in my experience, it's usually difficult to convince <coughs> the audience that this effect really is reproducible. So I said, and I made a sample of all the data points for you from different years and cities, like that we could establish the paradigm. It's really very scary. And um, this small effect it makes it a bit painful to work with, but nevertheless, we had quite some fun with it in the last sort of 10 years, I would say. So we started with parametric analysis, which means we looked at you know, effects of training, repetition, and intensity of the shock, and things like that. We also characterized how and the memory about the relief is uh, decaying after the training is over, so how the flies are forgetting about it. We took some candidate gene approaches. We tested four rows of uh, white gene and the sign of CG. We made a little mathematical model based on other nice dynamics to explain this function. And we also tested for initial critical and emergent neuronals. These are all old data, so I'm not going to show them. I'm going to focus on new things. But I would like to tell you that we're really proud because um, some of these analyses, they inspired uh, some collaborators in Würzburg from psychology as well as from Rodin's neurobiology to establish the same kind of paradigm in humans and rats. So here I can show you some human data. Now here, human subjects are trained with a visual cue, like a circle, and a little bit of electric shock on the skin. It's not too bad, I tried it myself too, so don't think we're crew or anything. So, and then, German. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <not> German. <laughs> well, church, two words, yeah. So, um, so I think the test, we do this. So, we measure their startle response in response to a uh, um, loud noise. So, basically, if I give you, you know, the, we call it Dawu. So, probably you call it Dawu or something. So, yeah. Dawu. Yeah. Um, 
So when you give them a strong uh, sound, you get a starch response, which is like jumping, basically, or blinking the eyes. And then you can measure whether such response is changed in the presence of this cue, which was either learned as a predictor for something painful or as a signal for something related. So this is called then the modulation of the starter response. So we could see that if you train people with um, Q shock pairings with a very long interval in between, starter response did not change in, response in comparison to baseline. But if you train them with Q shock, they were more startled in the presence of the Q. So they were fearful already. And if they were trained in the opposite timing, they were less startled in the presence of the Q because they were sort of chilled, you know, really flat. And uh, the same kind of experiments were done in rats using light as a cognition stimulus and food shock, and with the same outcome, basically. So um, I'm telling you this because I think this is the reason why uh, it is worth, you know, the effort to study relief learning in the flies, because whatever we find in terms of genetics or circuitry may potentially be translated to uh, evolutionary higher organisms. But let's come back to fly. I, I told you that I'm going to talk about ongoing projects. So we have two uh, big ongoing projects in my lab. One of them deals with um, genetic basis of punishment learning, especially in comparison to relief learning. And the other one is trying to map out the circuitry underlying relief learning. Now, let's start with the first one. Some time ago, when I was doing my PhD, we had uh, encountered this situation. So you may remember this experiment from the previous slide. Now here we do this experiment either for wild type flies, which is in gray, or for flies which are lacking the function of the wire chain altogether. It's a mouth. So you can see that if the interstitial interval between shock and motor is very long, like in this case, or in these cases, there's no difference between the two genotypes. They just both don't learn. If we do punishment training, such that odor comes first and then the shock comes, we see a better performance in the mutant as compared to the wild type. But if we do relief training, such that shock comes first and then the odor comes, we see worse performance in the mutant as compared to the wild type. So it seems like punishment learning is getting better in the mutant, whereas relief learning is getting worse. You see, there's some kind of balance between these two things, and we can keep that balance by only changing the functionality of a single gene, which is interesting. Another case, which I will not show about the data because it's under my data, is the case of the synapse gene. This is a gene which is important for the presynapse, and it basically regulates the vesicle pools. So it enables cyclic plasticity. In this case, when we mutate a synapse gene, both relief learning and punishment learning are impaired. So if you would look at this picture, you would think that it's going more towards zero in both cases. So we, so far, these two are the only genes we know that affect really different. And um, in my opinion, it's a bit of a problem that both of them are also affecting punishment learning. So we haven't so far really found a signature for really learning in terms of genetics. And that's why we started this project. So this project, what we want to do is to map candidate genes for relief learning and for punishment learning and to see what overlaps in between. So synapsin and light will end up here if we plot them in this Venn diagram. So to do that, to come up with candidate genes, we decided to do a genome-wide strategy. So uh, typically a drosophilus would take uh, mutants, like thousands of them, and test them one by one by one by one by one in relief learning to see which genes are important. But um, this is not really really clever for the deep learning because it's a very long procedure and it's, it's not really high throughput at all. That's why we decided to uh, skip the mutants and take advantage of nature variation. So now, if you look at flies, you know, in nature, they all look the same to you, to me as well, but they differ from each other. They have individual characteristics. They have a quantitative variation of all kinds of traits, eye color, eye size, purpose, size, wing patterns, everything. So now you can take this um, nature variation in the, in the environment and you can bring it into the lab by inbreeding. So what you do is you collect female flies and they already come with eggs which have been fertilized by the resmiots and you let them lay their eggs and the progeny is inbred for more than 20 generations 
and due to the genetic drift, you get inbred traits where within each strain, all the flies are genetically identical, and between strains, they differ substantially. It's like there's like one bottle of me and one bottle of you, one bottle of you, and so on. So this enables us to test the genetically same individual many times without really repeated testing. So it's like a really fortunate situation. When you say inbred, it means go through bad and stuff, but you don't do it. Or you simply no, let them. You just let them, yeah. So they're not exactly identical. Well, they, they vary to the extent that the female has, you know. No, no, but be, within one bottle, they're identical. You do it so long that finally, if you actually they checked it with, uh, with uh, oh, markers. Yes, exactly. So if you check them with markers, then you will see that they are all homozygous. It's almost all those high. And they are really also identical. So, but you have to do it really long time. Okay. Yeah? They did I think for 20 or 40 generations. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, the group of Trudy Marquet in the US, they were kind enough to generate some inbred strains like this. And the most important thing they did was to uh, analyze them in, with microarrays to come up with genome-wide gene expression levels. Unfortunately, the whole body expression levels, not half, but still. And they also sequence the genome of every strain. This is why we can tell they are antiquated also. And uh, to come up with all the single nucleotide and polymorphisms, which I'm going to call SNPs from now on. Now, any lab in the world can come up uh, and take these strains and measure some kind of behavioral or physiological trait in order to make association analysis. So what we did is we took these about 40 strains. We looked at their relief learning. We looked at their punishment learning. We added another behavior, which is the naive avoidance of shock. That means when flies are um, faced with the charts between a, a, a place where there are electric shocks and another place where there are no shocks, they just avoid the shock place, obviously. So like this, we thought we can compare the genetic architecture, so to say, between naive avoidance, learned avoidance, and learned approach. And the next step is then to bring together these data and these data in association analysis to uh, point to candidate genes for these three, three behaviors. Now, first let me show you the behavioral data. And up here you see the relief learning scores of the term eight strains plotted in box plots. You can see that they vary, also statistically, and I sorted them according to the um, best at the end. The more positive, the better. So what, what is the significance over there? Uh, this is what a is good result. Result. test, yeah, this is a significant result. Yeah, the significance is that. Which, for example, how they differ from one another. So this Tell test... Tell us one or two examples of high significance. Well, this test is a global test. It's like a, this is a global test. This means that it uh, compares across all the groups all at once. It's similar to an ANOVA, right. ex except it's a non-permitted test because we don't really have normal distribution in all groups. So we want to be on the same side. So that some strains differ significantly from others. Do you, do you conclude that? Oh, I think that maybe a better way of putting it would be that uh, the, uh, the variability across the strains is bigger than variability within each strain. So that is, I think, the conclusion of the test. So it doesn't point out whether it's this one from this one, but it points out all of them together. And actually, that is the important thing we will see in a bit. Not the pairwise differences, but the overall difference is the yeah. important thing for the association. Okay. Yeah. OK. So then we have the punishment learning scores here, which also differ across the strength. You realize that if I sort them according to relief score, then punishment scores are jittery. This already points out that the two kinds of learning don't always go together, right? And here you can see the shock avoidance scores, which are also jittery and very accurate. Now here, I plotted a um, correlation plot to show you that there is no really substantial correlation between relief scores and punishment scores, or between shock and punishment, or between shock and relief learning. So this is critical, because if you, uh, like now imagine that every gene that affects relief learning in a certain way also affects punishment learning in the same way. Like imagine all the genetic factors are the same. Then you would get a perfect correlation as much as the environmental variability influences. 
So, but we get something like more like a lack of correlation. That means that a sufficient amount of genetic factors that affect one or the other kind of behavior specifically. So it doesn't mean that there won't be any genes that's coming, right? But it means there are enough genes that are not coming. All right, so now we come to the association, right? So let me show you how we do this. And this may actually answer your question also a little bit. So now when people look at this data, they, they often say, okay, so look, this guy learns good and this guy learns bad. So which gene is different between them, right? But that's not really the way to look at it because between, um, you know, between these two cases, there's like hundreds, thousands of differences. So and all the genes are different, right? So there's no point looking at two by two, but we have to look by gene, gene by gene, basically. So we have to use the full power of the 38 chain. And that's what we do. So we take genes one by one, let's say we this one gene called CG something, and then we basically plot the expression level of this gene across the strength against the median relief learning score. So basically there are 38 points here. Each one of them is representing one strength. So then we look for a linear relationship between the expression level and the relief learning score. And you can get relationships that look like that, or you can get things look like that. Here are two examples for punishment learning. And here are two examples for um, shock avoidance. So since we look gene by gene, I think it's not really important which strain is different from which other one, but it's different that along this axis, we have enough variability across the strains. Can I, can I uh, of course. make a comment? Yes. You assume here that there is this one-to-one -one relationship between the behavior of the gene. If 10 genes are involved in this behavior, what will happen? So indeed, we don't assume that there's a one to one relationship. You don't assume. You just, because, yeah. you just use one one. Yeah, exactly. You could repeat that by using two random genes or three random genes. Yeah. Fifteen yeah. random. Yeah, yeah, but, but we look at all the genes basically. So basically, what happens is this: because but your analysis is based on what the sequence. So because this is a quantitatively varying behavior, basically many genes are going to affect this behavior, right? Yeah. And each gene is going to have a small effect on the behavior. Okay, so what we try to do is to pick up those small effects. So if, for instance, there was only one gene affecting really fine, then we would get a straight line. And we would never get this, of course. This would be like extreme surprise. So that is why we go for relationships which are not so strong even, right? Because there's a lot of scatter here, which is due to both the environmental noise and the fact that other genes also affect. So you basically look one by one, and what you ask is, in the over the background of all those other genes, does this gene have any small effect? This is what you're trying to do. But of course, we don't assume that there's one gene. Which of course not. Or does that? Is it that's what you ask? Well, I was asking that probably what you could do is just plot, you know, strain A versus strain B for all genes, and see what goes above or below the other. And pick up genes which are extremely different between any of the groups. And then see what, if you have subgroups where they have higher or low expression levels for a certain set of genes. But yeah. between uh, the, the uh, you know, the uh, 45 degree middle above or below that, and then pick up genes that are out of 500 genes and go back and do this analysis. Yeah, but we don't really expect such strong effects. Because these are nature very, like these are naturally varying strains. So any gene that has a big effect is going to be selected like you see, is going to have the pressure and will be selected out. So we, we actually were expecting small effects, right? And such small effects you can only only find out with many strains. Like if we had two hundred strains, we would be better off basically. If we had ten strains, we would have no chance. So fourteen we can barely survive. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure whether I answered your question. Perhaps it, it, uh, I will be sure. Uh, when you go on, perhaps things will be more clear. Yeah, okay. So basically like this, we go gene by gene by gene. You know, there are more than 16,000 genes in the, in the genome. And we test, we give to each one of them a chance. Of course, in most cases, there's no such relationship. And in some hundreds of cases, we can pick a relationship. And Obviously, we also don't plot for all the genes because we can't look through 16,000 plots. We do a linear regression.
regression analysis. Let's look for significance and the slope of the regression. All right. So now we uh, do something very similar in terms of the SNPs, single nuclear particle. There we have both sides, right? So let's look at this locus, where there's a polymorphism, some strength in the G, some has an A, and we separate them into a little type and look what is what their relief learning for. And we try to see whether there's a difference. And here's an example for punishment learning, here's an example for shock avoidance. And you can imagine you can I mean, you can imagine I picked the good examples to show you, right? And as a consequence of that. The distribution of the two alleles is unequal. So there are only four strands with this allele and 34 with the other one. And this is actually fitting to just real textbook knowledge of quantitative genetics. If you have a, a single nuclear type polymorphism with a large effect, then it is going to not occur very often. Because it may also affect other mechanisms or other um, um, you know, processes because of pleiotropic. And then the strains which carry that allele are going to be selected out because of the pressure. So this is also <laughs> typical. So here too, if you had two strains, and then look, you know, one point here, one point there, we couldn't really conclude anything, basically. All right, so now all this process is nothing more than just starting with so many genes and ending up with a certain number of candidates. So these are really candidates, that means they don't necessarily have a causal relationship to the behavior. So far, we are at the correlated level, right? So um, that is why it's very important to do validation. Let me point out the weakness of, of this uh, design. So now, this is a little bit like fishing, right? So you know, you throw your net and whatever comes up. So you may miss some fish which are valuable. There are many genes out there which are critical for relief learning, for instance, but also they're critical for I don't know, embryonic development, yeah? And these genes will never be variable across the strains because the ones who are outside a certain age will die before they come to our hands. So we will definitely miss some genes if they don't vary, if they don't have snatch. And we are also going to definitely fish some shoes, like false positives, because genes, they don't act in isolation. They, you know, they are regulated together and they, you know, regulate each other. So if a gene is co-regulated with another one, which is important for learning, we're also going to pick that gene just because of the correlation. Um, so that's why the next step is actually more important step. Uh, and we took that step for short avoidance so far, and now it is reviewed for relief and punishment. Now, with a certain um, you know, statistical threshold, we pick so many candidates. I should tell you that this statistical threshold is very, very good. Okay? So it's not really corrective, it's just, I mean, you do this and what you fish, you fish, you have to live with it. So, nevertheless, we took those candidates and we asked ourselves, what happens if we pick some genes from this list without looking at their molecular function, so in an unbiased way, if you like, and try to see whether specific mutants of these genes are going to show the expected phenotypes. So here, we did that for about 15 candidates, and we use a transposon insertion mutants. These are very typical mutants in the fly research that a little piece of the DNA is incorporated into the genome, and if it's aligned in the, within a gene or in the vicinity of the gene, it can disturb its function or not. So it may not always work. So we got 14 of them, and for um, seven cases, well, for six cases, we had a significant effect on shock avoidance. So always the the gray one is the mutant, and the black one is the corresponding contrast. In one case, there was a strong tendency, but it didn't survive the, um, the multiple testing correction. So we went one step further, we uh, reversed the mutation. So now these transposons, they're inserted into a gene, and you can basically remobilize them by using a, a transposate, and then they just either uh, come out cleanly, leaving this gene white hybrid, like everything is repaired and fine, or they can jump out, taking a piece of the gene with them, and then you have a deletion mutant. So we were lucky in this case that from this gene we got one deletion mutant and three different cases, independent cases of precise jump out, as we call it. So that means these are three different white type control, and this is a new mutant than this one. So this is a novel case. And uh, thus we could actually verify the effect of the gene on the shock avoidance. So 
we were pretty happy that we could you know, verify six, seven genes out of 14, and one of them even double validated. So considering that we didn't look at the molecular function at all, I think it's, it's pretty OK. Another thing that we can do is that more fancy, you can try to make gene network analysis. But the thing with gene network analysis, there are many, many methods to do them. So there are really different ways of doing them. And these ways can give different results also. So in our case, we uh, use um, the existing data on protein-protein interaction, on physical interaction. And now we prove this big network of interactions based on our statistical association results. That means we start with you know, 50,000 genes or proteins, and then we basically cut every node that doesn't have a good association with shock avoidance, and every node that has an association stays. And like this, we can cut here and there, here and there, and finally we get something smaller. And well, then you look at this, you wonder, well, what is it? Right? So then what we did, we went online and we looked up the function of all of these genes. Most of them were not really known at all, not uh, studied at all. Uh, a couple of things popped up. One of them was the fact that there were more or less more than expected genes, these blue ones, which were important for Bristol functioning. So they, basically these were various genes which were important for the development of bristles and so on. Now these bristles, they are hair-like structures on the, on the fly body, which are important for making sensation. So considering that shock is a strange and really unnatural stimulus to start with, and we have no idea how it is really sensed, now maybe this network gives us an interesting hypothesis that bristles are important for shock sensation. But you have to really understand that this is just a hypothesis, because this is like a really highly explorative uh, thing. So there is no causal relationship. It's, it's not really, it's just hypothesis generation. Right? And now in the next years, we would like to explore this hypothesis using proper reverse genetic methods and to see whether there is uh, something really in it. All right, now um, what we're doing nowadays is to do this same follow-up for relief learning and punishment learning, because those are the ones that we're really interested in. And we're hoping that we get 50% validation success also with those, because that would give us a little relief learning genes, which we have only two at the moment. But if now um, I had a wish free, <laughs> I, would, I would wish for alternative methods for gene network analysis to see whether this bristle function hypothesis comes up using various methods. I mean, I, my collaborators only use this one method, so there are different ways of doing it. And uh, another interesting thing would be to do this whole, whole strategy at the level of the proteome. So can you find associations between behavioral scores and the protein levels? Because after all, proteins do the job and not the RNAs. And um, in the fly, it will also be possible probably to cellularly localize the function of the gene. That means this gene is important for choke avoidance. Is it functioning in the bristle, for instance? And another interesting thing would be to see whether such genes would be clinically relevant in humans. And we have some collaborations with psychologists in my group for this. Whether, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder patients have polymorphisms in these genes, and anxiety disorders, and so on. All right. So now let's come to the second project, which is going to be a little uh, shorter, because we just started this project. We just got finding for it. Now this one is about uh, circuitry. Okay. So when we train the slides with odor and shock, we know pretty well what happens in the brain. So the odor is activating station after station in the olfactory pathway, and uh, this activity ends up in the so-called canyon cells of the mushroom body. Mushroom body is like the basic associative center of the fly brain. It's important for all kinds of learning. So now in the candy cell level, there are many cells, about 2,000 cells. And if you give a particular odor, only 5% of them are activated. So there is a sparse coding of the odors at that level. Now this is the odor pathway, right? And when we give a shock, some sensor neurons are activated. We do not know which ones. This is not really. Uh, hasn't been studied so far yet. But what is important is that particular set of dopaminergic neurons are responsive to shock. And these dopaminergic neurons are labeled them in red. They project to the canyon cells as well. So in the canyon cells, this 
other information on the one hand and the shock reinforcement information on the other hand, they coincide to activate synaptic plasticity. As a result, the canyon cells that they cause for this particular odor, they change their connection strength to the next layer of neurons, canyon cell efferent neurons, which then project to premotor centers for function approach of the world. So this circuit is figured out in an extremely nice way. People have really discovered single cells that do the job for shock. And single cells that lead out these memories from the mushroom with the canyon cells or avoidance. On top, they also figured out which other dopaminergic neurons carry a reward signal and which other canyon cell different neurons read out the reward memories. So really, we are talking about single cell level. And uh, you will see in a bit how this is possible. OK, now we think that our job is to bring really learning into this picture, right? So now, um, some of you probably know, all of this is possible because in the slide, you have the alpha US system, which enables you to express anything, any transgene in any set of neurons or cells that you want. So it works like this, for those who haven't heard about it, you put um, the coding sequence for a transcription factor was about four under the control of a certain enhancer or promoter, a regulatory region. So this is self specific. You can make this only, for example, the promoter that's only active in the dopaminergic neurons, we can put there. So well, four is expressed in the dopaminergic neurons. And in another slide you put uh, for example a neural blocker or a fluorescent protein or whatever you like under the control of an upstream activating system. Then you cross these two flags together, bring two pieces, and the transcription factor that is expressed in those neurons comes and binds to the activating sequence, and the neural blocker is then only expressed in those neurons. So it's really very similar. When we do that, to block the output of the mushroom with the neuron, we can in itself, we lose relief learning completely as compared to the genetic control. So indeed, relief learning is sitting in the mushroom bodies. But we do not know how a relief signal may be transmitted to the mushroom bodies and which neurons read out this memory. So we would like to now find these things out and bring the relief learning into the really detailed picture. And uh, I'm very, very lucky because nowadays the, the GAL4 US system has become even better. So people have separated the GAL4 into its DNA binding domain and its activation domain. So one piece of GAL4 is expressed under the control of one kind of regulatory sequence, and the other piece is expressed under the control of another regulatory sequence. Let's say that these neurons in white are the ones where this enhancer fragment is active, and these ones are the ones which have this enhancer fragment active. Well, only in the neurons of intersection, a functional GAL4 can be made and then it's going to transcribe the fluorescent marker in this case, see? So like this, with this intersectional reasoning, you can bring down the resolution to single pair of neurons in the brain. So, and we are very lucky because people in Janelle Farnoshi also and have proven, they have made a collection of such flies, you know, combinations of enhancers. And the, with this collection, you can target all the neurons in the circuitry. So all the canyon cell types, all the dopaminergic neuron types, and all these canyon cell different neurons, and in very small groups, like sometimes really one by one. And now we can block such neurons one by one and see what happens to the learning. That's the project. Here you can see how the situation seems for these neurons, canyon cell different neurons. We are trying to find out which neurons read out the memory from the mushroom. So you can see this matrix. On the x-axis, you see the driver line. Yeah? On the y-axis, you see the neuron types. So you can see that, for example, this driver only targets this one neuron type. This driver only targets this neuron type. There are some drivers, like this one, which targets a couple of times. And it's also important that one type of neuron is often targeted by multiple lines independently, so you can validate basically. Now we uh, use these lines one by one to express um, a potassium channel 
which uh, but over express blocks a two potential. Now we can block these kinds of neurons one by one, right? Here is a genetic control, so they learn to release the enemy in a way. And then you can see in most of the cases the relief time level is normal, fine, as expected. And then we find some cases where relief learning is below the normal level. And so far one case where it is way better than the normal level. Okay, so this means by blocking, for instance, for instance, these neurons here corresponding to this line, we can make relief learning better. So that means these two neuron types are candidates for us now. And we will try to test this line here, this gyro line, to validate that candidate. In this part of the matrix, there is a very fortunate situation coming in. Now, please look at this gyro line, which um, gets these five kinds of neurons. And there's an impairment of relief learning when you block those five kinds of neurons. And if you block only two of these kinds, you also get the same impairment of relief learning. Whereas if you block the other two kinds, you are fine with relief really learning. So by using this combinatorial argument, we can really come up with nice candidates, right, for reading out memory space for relief really learning. But this is work in progress, so this week, for instance, we were scheduled to test these flies, these uh, driver lines, and at the end of the year, we will be done with this, all this basically. All right, so um, once we're done with it, we will we have a collection uh, an additional you know, source of lines to well revalidate these candidates. And then we also want to do the same kind of screen and validation for the different types of mushroom with itself and also different types of dopaminergic neurons which bring the input to the cancer. Now if I had a wish or two <coughs> wishes, they would be the following ones. So now it would be interesting to know these neurons which read up to the leaf memory. Do they change their auto responsiveness after training? So do they get more or less exempted by the uh, relief odor after training? That would be really nice to address the task of imaging. And uh, likewise, once we find the dopaminergic neurons for relief learning, it would be really nice to look at their costume responses in the presence of shock and also to try to um, activate them optogenetically or thermogenetically to see whether you can substitute for their interest. Because with the Galford wave system, you can basically express a thermal channel to then turn on the neurons with heat and turn them off again. Well, for these, I will need them for operators, but this one we can do on our own. Well, so then, when all of this is done, we hope that we can put this little addition to the nice picture. And I think once all of this is done, this is a perfect system to do modeling because we know the numbers of cells, and there's EM level connectome coming up. So we will know with exactly which neurons connect to which ones, which, what size of the synapse. And, um, and at the end, one can really come up with a mathematical model of how only one brain structure, where a lot of different inputs are coming, can you know, juggle with all the different kinds of memory and how to keep them separately or how to make them interact when necessary. So that's why I think a long-term uh, outcome of this project could really be a mathematical Model. So I hope that I showed you how we can take advantage of a well-established associated learning paradigm, mutant collections, and transgenic tools for manipulating neurons and a relatively simple brain. I should thank to my co-workers. So the genetic project was started in the lab of Tani Monto, and it was Miriam's PhD thesis, my student, and um, it was possible with the collaboration with bioinformatics department in the University of Bristol. And the uh, neuronal project we started in Michael, these are the people involved, and these are our collaborators. So we get this uh, funding from these agencies, apart from the institute, of course, also. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, questions for after the talk. Uh, 
Um, so you cannot have a deletion mutants, for example. But often they, these deletions, they span more than one gene. And then you, you know, take out three, four genes at a time, and you can't really test for the effect of the gene you want. And on top of that, there are not really big collections of them. So that means you don't really have a convincing uh, control line, which is isogenic, which is in terms of the rest of the genetic background identical to this one. So we chose the transposons because there are big collections of them with a defined background. Okay, it's not really very defined anymore because it's been 20 years since it was made, but still it's better than taking any one types by random, right? So that is why we chose them. And this is why I think one should take that into account when one you know, judges on the 50% validation rate, yeah. Right. Also, it's also nice because if you start with transposon insertions, you can then make deletion with it, like we did. Probably this we will do many times for the release learning, for shock avoidance, okay, we didn't, we didn't want to do it so much because it wasn't really the focus. So it was more like a case study, yeah. RNA I would also be a good option. Uh, did you try uh, at all your sweet gut force that gave you a, let's say, positive uh, they are positive in your lead assay, and to see how they behave in the punishment assay or the uh, avoidance, shock avoidance yeah. assay, and whether you found any overlaps between yes. the cell population that you Yes, <coughs> so, yeah, that's a great question. Other people did that. So this split line, when they were generated, people, of course, everybody jumped on them. And the first thing they did was punishment and reward learning, because it was just simpler to do. And uh, for instance, these two neuron types, they are the strong candidates for punishment learning, for instance. So it seems that there is, there is a common, something common between the neurons that read out relief memories and the ones that read out the uh, punishment memory. So this is, for instance, really an interesting point because now we want to know whether the other responses of those neurons are like up and down depending on the timing during training. So that, and also these, all these lines were tested for reward learning also, but there's so far no overlap in our hits and the reward learning hits. And they were tested also for shock avoidance. They were normal. We didn't do it, but they were done as a control, basically. So, so the basic shock avoidance probably is not really about the mushroom body, but more the condition avoidance of the learned or the going to the mushroom body. Yeah. So in all stages, we are going to compare the hits to the other people's hits from punishment and reward. Yes. You see, there are some that are in the same, that map to the same cells, and some that don't map to the same cells so far. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for example, in other cases. Oh, no, I didn't. I took out the labels because the lines are not published and they're not my work. But in one of these cases where there's no effect, it's one of also one of the hottest candidates for punishment learning, which is not common with relief learning. So it's really, yeah. So we have to figure out at the end of the screen how much is common and why. And it's still the same order that you are using for the relief uh, paradigm and for the punishment paradigm. Uh, punishment paradigm. Yeah, typically we use red at the height of the null. I mean, some, um, some parameters of training can differ from lab to lab, and that's why uh, once we are uh, you know, done with determining our own candidates, we will test them again for punishment learning, of course. So far, we can compare to external data, which we communicate with people all the time. But later, we will test them ourselves with the exact number of trials and timing and everything. So, okay. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I think they're both interesting. I mean, I, I think they're equally interesting because 
Yeah, one well, has to then later on go a little into imaging, I think, because mm. if enderon is not common, then yeah, it's easier to you know imagine. Okay, so really, you know, memory is read up by this neuron, tap tap goes to approach this one, reads the punishment memory, tap goes to the button smash. But if you have an overlap, I mean, it's more interesting in the sense that if you can play around more, you know, you can do like how does it work? Is this That's one synapse you know changed in two different ways? What is it? Part time in different classes? Thank you all for coming.